again, uh, very bullish about U.S. real estate. I'm actually making the move to the to the U.S. All our investments are in the U.S. Uh, so overall, two thumbs up for uh, you know, the real estate market long term. Welcome to the Wealth Strategy Secrets of the Ultra Wealthy Podcast, where we help entrepreneurs like you exponentially build wealth through passive income to live a life of freedom and prosperity. Are you tired of paying too much in taxes, gambling your future on the stock market, and want to learn about hidden strategies for making your money work for you? And now your host, Dave Wolcott, serial entrepreneur and author of the best-selling book, The Holistic Wealth Strategy. Hey everyone, welcome to today's show on Wealth Strategy Secrets. We've got another awesome show for you guys today. Today we are joined by August Biniaz. August is the co-founder and COO of CPI Capital. CPI Capital is a real estate private equity firm with a mandate to acquire multifamily, build to rent, and single family rental assets while partnering with passive investors as limited partners. August was instrumental in the closing of over 208 million of multifamily assets since inception. August educates real estate investors through webinars, YouTube shows, weekly newsletter, and one-on-one -on -one coaching. He's also the host of the Real Estate Investing Demystified podcast. August, my friend, good to see you. Welcome. Great to see you as always, Dave. Yeah, absolutely. Have been looking forward to this conversation for quite a while. Uh, there's so much going on in the marketplace. Seems like on a, on a monthly basis right now, just so many different changes and everything. Uh, so curious to get your insights on, you know, how you're reacting, you know, what you're looking at. But, um, but why don't we uh, start the interview off with telling, you know, listeners who don't know about you, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into the space. And I know you have a unique perspective from that, you know, coming from that uh, developer background as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. My, I'm really a real estate guy. I started out as a real estate agent uh, close to 17 years ago. Um, and I wasn't really good at being a real estate agent, but I was good at seeking deals and, and finding deals. So I started uh, doing small fix and flips, uh, eventually started uh, my own general contracting company, I moved on to building single family homes, uh, both spec and custom. Uh, spec homes are homes you build and put on the market to sell. Custom homes are homes you build for a client. So I was doing both of those. Always wanted to scale. And, um, a, you know, a project came across my desk was five single family homes. It was what we call here uh, in West Coast of Canada, land assembly. And you could build 20 townhomes on there. So um, I didn't have the equity needed to close on that deal. It was an $8.7 million acquisition price. And I took the deal to a few friends, business associates, and I was able to raise over $5 million on that project. And the deal I had with my partners at that time, I didn't know re uh, syndication, real estate, private equity. I didn't understand the GPLP structure. This was all alien to me. So we just created a company. We put shareholder agreements in place. And I was to get a portion of the profits uh, uh, you know, relative to the performance of the project. And I fell in love with that model, with that idea, with this concept of finding the deal, finding the investors, bringing on all the professionals needed. And I couldn't develop that project either as, as a general contractor because I was focused on single family. I brought on a architect, I brought on a GC and the project went, went really well. And that was kind of my start into the private equity space. Um, so I started educating myself lots on how to raise capital, this whole concept of, uh, you know, structuring deal in the syndication format. But most of the content was coming from the U.S. I'm based here in Vancouver. And I realized this new asset class, which is multifamily and the business model of value add. And that was kind of my start. I partnered up with a couple of partners and we uh, co-founded CPI Capital, uh, which was initially a Canadian private equity firm uh, focused on partnering with Canadians to allow them to have exposure to U.S. multifamily, but then we, we, we saw that a lot of U.S. investors are reaching out to us, and um, actually those numbers are growing faster than our Canadian investor numbers, and that's where we are today. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, super interesting background. And and so how, um, I, I mean, it's a really interesting topic. Um, and I know we do have some international listeners out there. Uh, so maybe let's go into that for a second is, you know, 
what does the structure look like if you you're an investor in Canada or another country and you want to invest into the U.S. Is that is it something that's you know easy to do or how can you help investors facilitate that? Absolutely. I mean, U.S. Most countries make the process of foreign investors investing in their country, uh, you know, as simple as possible because you want that foreign investment, particularly um, U.S. And then its relationship with Canada. So there's a treaty between Canada and the U.S. that allows, um, you know, Canadians to invest into the U.S. and also be relieved from double taxation or any of those concert, uh, cons, uh, you know, concerns. Now, when it comes to the uh, the private equity side of things, when it comes to raising capital and bringing on LPs, passive investors, that's what makes it a bit more complex. Um, uh, usually these structures need Canadians to have to file U.S. taxes, uh, deal with the IRS, uh, have to you know get an I-10 number if they're investing as an individual, an EIN number if they're investing as a corporation. So it makes it a bit more complex. And But yeah, there's definitely ways around it a quick advice that I can give is really using LLCs to structure deals in the U S has become very sexy, uh, you know, in, in recent times. And a lot of people use LLCs, uh, limited partnerships are actually a better structure to use to, uh, put deals together. Uh, for example, here in Canada, we have a, we have corporations like you have in, in the U S like a C corp and, and we have limited partnerships. We didn't have this, uh, uh this kind of a quasi, uh, entity in, in the middle, which is LLC. We don't even have LLCs here in Canada. So uh, one of the ways to structure deals in the US to make it more efficient for foreign investors is utilizing a limited partnership, which is looked at as a flow through entity, whereas a LLC is not a flow through entity. So any type of returns received from LLC are seen by a CRA, Canadian Revenue Agency as dividends, and then they're taxed uh, on both sides of the border. So um, you know, utilizing limited partnerships makes the process a lot easier. Great. August, tell us about your journey into uh, real estate and building wealth. As, as you know, we like to talk about wealth strategy, right? And, uh, you know, different tactics and, and tips and insights as to, you know, how people have accelerated their journey, some of those learning lessons and things. And obviously you, you got into real estate at an early age. You saw some of the benefits of that. And then you've scaled, you know, quite well. So um, can you tell us a little bit about that journey and some insights from there? Yeah, no, absolutely. As a as a real estate investor, as a real estate professional, I've been involved in many different aspects of real estate, but I've also been involved in other businesses. When I was introduced to real estate private equity, uh, I, I felt that I had found the holy grail of uh, wealth building because when you look at this business, how it's is very uh, you know focused on investors and for the investor success, and a lot of time the general partner is really being compensated relative to the performance of the project, both in the private equity space or the real estate private equity space is really, I fell in love with that concept because as a builder, as a real estate agent, uh, we're just conduits. We're, we're, we're getting a fee no matter what happens with a project. But as a general partner, the majority of the profits are made on the back end and it's a portion of the total profit that a deal makes. So if the deal goes belly up, the general partner doesn't really make any, uh, you know, any profits. Moreover, uh, if you're a real estate agent or a home builder, you have that margin of error where, where you, you know, some of your projects might not make money or some of your investors might, uh, you know, your clients might lose money. But as a general partner, if you lose investor money, that stigma sticks with you for the rest of your career. So I really love that part of the business. But then again, on the general partner, and, and that's kind of the, the investor security side of things. Uh, but on the general partner side, I really see this as infinite returns is the is one of the only businesses in the world that it creates infinite returns because a general partner can source a deal. Obviously, there's opportunity cost and cost that goes into sourcing deals and having the infrastructure in place to service investors. But if you look at it this way, a, a general partner goes out there, finds a deal, finds their investors, and then receives a portion of the profits by in some cases not needing to put any amount of actual capital in. So I see it really as infinite returns for a general partner that kind of puts the deal together and brings everybody together. So that was what really excited about me about this business. And also this other part of it was scalability. As a single family home builder, I saw my peers who um, it was, they were multi-generational. They're people that their grandfathers were in the business and now 
their grandchilds were able to build larger projects. It took a long time to scale. Whereas real estate private equity, as long as you're great at sourcing deals, as long as you're great at executing the business plan and you're great at partnering with investors, the, the ceiling is just so high. It's, it, it's limitless, really. And you can see that with companies like Blackstone, over $2 trillion of assets under management, BlackRock, uh, over $10 trillion of assets under management. So the scalability, that was another thing that really excited me about this business. Yeah, absolutely. And I love the performance driven model, you know, because I think so many people, again, their exposure has been to Wall Street and, you know, working with financial planners that are making fees, whether the market goes up or down. Right. But in this case, right. And I mean, this is this is the true you know, definition of entrepreneurs. Right. It's risk reward. So you're taking on that additional risk as a GP. Uh, you're going to get rewarded for that risk if it goes well. Um, and if it doesn't go well, you know, you're not going to make anything. Right. But but as you pointed out, I think um, it's critical. Right. That, you know, keeping investors whole uh, in the process and building out that reputation and credibility is paramount. Absolutely. Any other, uh, so I know you do a lot of uh, coaching, uh, you know, you have uh, multiple shows and such. Um, are there any key insights that you're constantly, you know, giving, um, you know, some of the people that you talk to in this whole, you know, space of, of, of investing and growing their wealth? I'll, I'll go a step above that and I'll talk about that advice I keep giving myself on a daily basis. And, 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 and that's really focus. It's focus is it's, it's mastering your craft is being a specialist. And you can see that in many different, uh, you know, um, very successful sectors. You can see that within the medical space. You can see that within the de uh, construction development, people building high rises. There's always specialties. There's not this, um, uh, you know, I was reading Atul Gwande's uh, book and how he got um, uh, the, the checklist manifesto and he, how he, uh, you know, the, he, he actually formatted his checklist from a lot of these high rise and these big project developers. And they initially back in the day, it was a master builder that, that basically oversaw all the aspects of develop, developing a project, but then it got, the process got much more specialized and all these different contractors and trades came in and th that was their uh, mastery. And they would, they would all join together to build a great project. So, you know, you see that in the medical field as well, you know, you go to your GP and you get sent to a specialist because that's what they specialize on. So I would really say, you know, having that focus and being great at what you do and then scaling from there really, right. You can always grow from there. You can always scale from there. If you're, you have mastered, uh, you know, a niche within the real estate space, for example, you know, the real estate ecosystem is so large, there's a lot of different business models. There's short-term rentals, fix and flips, ground up developments. There's uh, syndication, be it multifamily or other business models is mastering, uh, you know, one aspect and then growing from there. Uh, and I, for, for younger people, if somebody's younger listening to this and they haven't really finished college yet, I would say the same thing is going through college, getting a degree, and then going from there. I know so many uh, lawyers, attorneys that don't even practice law. They're, they're doing other businesses, a lot of sports agents uh, who come from the law background. So mastering something initially and scaling from there would be my, my, my advice, uh, quick and simple. 100%. That is one of the top 10 traits of billionaires is staying focused in only, you know, one to three areas. It's, uh, it's amazing. And the further up you go in terms of net worth, um, it's just less and less things that they actually do. Like a lot of the, you know, top billionaires, they're just focusing literally on one thing. That's all they do and getting kind of deeper there. And it's interesting because I think there's also um, a little bit of a push pull there. Uh, because if you're wired as an entrepreneur, you get excited about shiny little objects and things that could be great, you know, here or there. So it definitely takes some work to become focused. What are your thoughts, August, in terms of, you know, if some folks out there are interested in getting into this space as an active investor versus passive investor? And, and I think it's a, it's a really important distinction because uh, sometimes people get excited or they might start as an LP and then they might think about kind of expanding, you know, into the space because they've had some success and everything. Uh, so, you know, what are, what are your thoughts on the, you know, the dichotomy between those two? 
No, for sure. Um, you know, with the success that real estate has had over the last, you know, 10, 12 years, uh, there's been a lot of LPs that have seen so much significant returns on their investments. And they're like, what is, how is this even possible? And that was really the impetus for them to want to kind of explore, explore this space and get into the space. We can see that with many physicians who've come over and have left their practices as cardiologists or neurosurgeons to be syndicators. And it's really mind boggling to me because my mom always wanted me to be a physician. And these days I'm telling my mom, Hey mom, look, all these doctors are coming into my space, the real estate space, <laughs> you know? So, uh, so, so no, for sure. There's, there's a lot of people as L who, who started as LPs and saw the potential and who are coming into the space. There's all a lot of people, also a lot of people who are, who are seeing, a lot of content online about the growth of real estate, wanting to be involved in real estate in some capacity. The advice really, if, if you want to kind of start, uh, you know, building an actual real estate business, if it's a syndication business, if you're syndicating these larger deals, if it's a, uh, you're looking to joint venture and put a business together is of course, to get a mentor and a coach. There's, a, you know, this business gets complex. You're dealing with a lot of money. You're dealing with institutions for debt. And, and, and other items. So it's very important to have coaches uh, and also immersing yourself in the space, uh, podcast, uh, j just as this one here, uh, YouTube shows, books, immersing yourself in the space and understanding that uh, this is not a kind of a, a side gig or a, a side hustle. This is a full-time business and you're competing with uh, people who have dedicated their lives to this business um, and, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, there, there, you know, and, and there's a bit of survival fallacy as well. A lot of times people come into the space and they see that, uh, you know, random, uh, person, uh, you know, a chiropractor who, who came and has a billion dollars of assets under management, and then they see that survival fallacy, but they also don't see a lot of people who came into the active side and didn't make it, uh, give a quick story. When I was building um, single family homes, at some point, a lot of my focus was being on, as a a custom home builder. So I wanted to be the best custom home builder. Anybody who built homes in the, our city here in Richmond, I wanted, I wanted me to be the top builder. And I was getting a lot of contracts. All my time was more focused on building custom homes rather than spec homes as a, de as a developer. I was seeing my clients making millions of dollars over those few years. And me as a, as a GC making my cost plus, uh, you know, uh, contract a nominal amount compared to what they were doing. I had I could have easily done way better, uh, you know, not having to build for others and just, you know, partner with a few partners and, and build, um, uh, you know, spec homes. So in some cases, the LPs long-term actually make more than, a, you know, a, a failed GP or a GP who makes, you know, nominal amounts. So uh, assess it, come into the space, learn about it, see if it really makes sense. But at times, being an LP, you, you can cherry pick the best GPs to work with. You can cherry pick the best business models. You can partner with somebody wor working on uh, industrial. You can partner with someone working on, uh, you know, multifamily or BTR SFR. It's, it, you know, the world is at, at your fingertips really as an LP. So um, that's kind of my long way of answering that question. Yeah, interesting story. I think there's one aspect of that that people really underestimate. And it's the fact that, you know, you are your greatest asset, right? And it's understanding that. So you have to figure in the opportunity cost. So if you're a great surgeon, right, and you do that really well, you get compensated well for that. So if you start now dabbling in some single family rentals because you think it's a good idea for tax reasons and such like that, and now it's pulling away from your time at what you do really well, you know, you're not being as efficient with your time and you're really not respecting your time, right? So, you know, in this space, there's a great opportunity to collaborate, right, with partners and getting people, just as you said, people who've dedicated their entire lifetime and their career, like just into acquisitions in a certain market and a certain asset type. They've been doing it, you know, forever. They have all the relationships and then you're going to go try to compete with them. Well, if you can collaborate, right, and then leverage, you know, leverage other people's time and relationships, you know, and be as efficient as possible about your time, you know, I think you can see more exponential growth there. 100%. 
So August, tell us a little bit about the market right now. So it's uh, April, 2023, at the time of this recording, you know, lots going on this year uh, for sure that, that, that really can't be underestimated. Uh, so what's your you know, view of the market in terms of you know, multifamily? Where are you seeing opportunities? Where are you seeing risks? How are you advising your clients? Yeah, no, uh, to say that the market is choppy is really an understatement. Uh, the capital markets are in turmoil. Uh, uh, you know, the Fed has uh, this uh, elephant in the room, which is inflation that they have to defeat. And one of the main levers they have uh, to pull to fight inflation is increasing interest rates. And, you know, we all saw the Fed increasing interest rates that was all on, on all of our feeds. And we saw it queued. Oh, they raised it. And we're all trying to guess 75 basis points. Okay, 25 basis points, kind of the guessing game. But the the cracks in the infrastructure that, you know, that, that increased interest rates are creating is truly scary. And you can see that with failure of banks. When banks in the richest country in the world start fa failing, those are scary times, right? So, and then you also seeing the ripple effect now happening on to, uh, uh, you know, commercial real estate. You're having a lot of syndicators who didn't account for in the rates going up this fast, or they were not stupid enough to purchase interest rate caps, which is an insurance policy on your uh, in interest rates failing and investors losing capital. You have institutions like Blackstone walking away from some of their uh, office space deals, but Obviously, there's always opportunities, you know, in this, uh, you know, when there's blood on the streets, um, there's always opportunities as well. At the same time, the Blackstone is losing investors' capital. They also raised the largest fund, a real estate fund ever in history, which was a which is a thirty billion dollar fund, and they're just sitting on the sideline, ready to, uh, you know, come back into the market and be opportunistic. Um, overall, um, I feel bullish about U.S. real estate. The rent to value ratios that are in the US are unseen anywhere else in the world. I see it happening here in Canada, being very uh, having my uh, fingers on the pulse in Canada and kind of uh, being somewhat of a, uh, you know, looking at the history uh, of, of real estate here in Canada, the cap rates compressing significantly over the last 20 years and people still buying deals at two, two uh, you know, a two cap, a 2% cap, where in most cases that's negative cash flow. If you put down, 70%, if you put down 30%, borrow 70% from the bank, you're in, you know, uh, you're in negative cash flow. So you have to put up more money every month to just service your debt. But people are still buying uh, deals. Institutions like REITs are still buying deals here in Canada. So I feel that the, the margins are still there in US real estate, uh, still the richest country in the world. Uh, there's an interest rate migration happening in the U.S., something you don't really see in other countries. Like, for example, in Canada, you don't see half a million people moving here, half a million people moving there. I think, unfortunately, eventually, long term, uh, the U.S. will turn into Canada uh, like it has in California and New York. Cap rates will be compressed so much that, um, you know, smaller groups can no longer buy institutional asset institutionals will act institutional assets will actually be reserved for institutions as it as as they have been historically because only REITs can come in buy a 50 million dollar apartment community and at a, at a two cap right and uh, that only makes sense because they're playing the appreciation game so uh, i think we're still in this goldilocks period where we could still syndicate deals and have those types of margins um but yeah overall Bullish about the market, I feel that the Fed is probably going to do another 25 basis point interest rate increase and um, uh, the Fed's funds rate increase rather, it will affect the interest rates differently. And I think they will, they will plateau there and they will see what's going to happen, what's happening with the inflation. Uh, and uh, I think at some point in Q1 or Q2 2024, they might actually start decreasing interest rates uh, because I feel that the majority of the CPI uh, uh, you know, com consumer price index, which gives us where our inflation numbers are at, is lagging because the majority of that number is on rents, and those rents are still they haven't uh, come into the numbers yet. So uh, I think we're going to see a big drop in the inflation numbers, hoping to come to that two and a half percent mark over the next couple of quarters. So I think overall, again, uh, very bullish about U.S. real estate. I'm actually making the move to the to the U.S. All our investments are in the U.S. Uh, so overall, two thumbs up for uh, uh, you know the real estate market long term.
Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I think people underestimate the, the really the fundamentals, right, about the entire, uh, you know, sector, right, and what's going on. And it's, it's easy to react to certain, you know, noise or certain things going on, right, in the media, the interest rates. I mean, there's one kind of effect. But yeah, if you look at those uh, bullish things that are going on, I mean, just look at, for instance, the, the immigrant demographic, coming into the US. I mean, it's as big as it's ever been and it's getting bigger. And if you're an immigrant coming into the country, you're not going to be buying a, a single family house for your first time, right? You're just going to, you're going to be renting. And then we're in states as, as you know, and Florida is now the fourth biggest in terms of GDP in the entire country. And they have a massive budget surplus, right? So you drive around Florida, yeah. It's a bigger GDP than the whole country of Canada. So it just and we're part of one of the G, G7 countries, one of the you know uh, wealthiest countries in the world. And the state of Florida alone has a larger economy than the whole country of Canada. It has more. It has more international airports than the whole country of Canada. Yeah, I mean it's it's really staggering. But when you think about those, right, from an investment standpoint, right, and you know you're investing in these markets, right, that have jo high job growth, high population growth, you know, I think you get a little bit more, um, you know, recession resistance, right, in some of these markets because you have the fundamentals, you know, on your side. Absolutely. And what do you think uh, from the build to rent perspective? I know that's a new asset class. Um, a lot of investors might not necessarily be familiar with. So um, what are your thoughts uh, there? Absolutely. Yeah. Build to rent, um, uh, you know, is a very interesting asset class. I, I got to give a quick, quick story about where BTR SFR came from. B BTR SFR build to rent single family rental. These are basically portfolios or communities of single family homes that are built and managed for the purpose of renting and they just perform and behave just like multifamily. They're basically horizontal multifamily projects. Um, uh, and the start for this asset class was post GFC when there was a lot of uh, you know, foreclosed homes, Wall Street got involved and started buying uh, you know, uh, tens of thousands of single family homes, both scattered site and sites and port, uh, you know, portfolios or communities of these homes. And the plan was really just to sell these homes when the market turned around, because we all know real estate is cyclical. So they were buying it in a down market, pennies on a dollar. And the plan was to resell them when the market came back up. And Blackstone was involved in these projects as well. Uh, but what they did is while they were holding these assets, they, start, uh, they started managing them. They started uh, renting them out. And they realized that single family homes in a portfolio, in a community, they, just, they behave just like multifamily and their NOIs were very high and they basically was a start for this new asset class that was created. And then when the interest rates um, and, um, you know, when the economy came back up and the price of single family uh, came back to where the market was and they could no longer buy these things pennies on a dollar, uh, Wall Street actually started building single family um, you know, these SFR communities, these BTR communities and, and uh, from the ground up. So they partner with developers to build these things. So that's kind of the start of BTR SFR. Um, you see a lot of them, uh, you know, being built in, uh, again, the Sun Belt because the business model makes sense. So we're, we're very bullish on this asset class because, you know, if you have an option to live in an apartment where you have tenants, you know, have neighbors next to you, above you, below you, or you live in a community of single family homes, Obviously, the choice is, is there, um, you know, and then also you, since, you know, it's not like you're going into a neighborhood and you're renting a single family home and people around you, most people own their homes in a community of single family homes. Everybody rents. So on this kind of the, uh, the comfort level of uh, renters, they feel great as well. And some of these uh, communities have amenities as well. Uh, but as far as syndicating these deals, we, we looked at a project where we got involved with where it wasn't built yet. And it's pretty difficult to get investors to come on board for something that's not there, something they can't feel in touch, something that's not stabilized. So the, uh, the business model that we're looking at within the BTR SFR space is stabilized, already performing assets that are, you know, um, at least at least 50 uh, single family homes as a community up to 100 because, you know, those, that's the sweet spot for this asset class. But yeah, it's a um, it's a new and up and coming asset class. I'm sure if you're listening or watching this show over the next little while, you hear more and more about it. So watch out for that asset class and to have some exposure to it would be great as well.
Yeah, very interesting asset class. And then definitely going into those markets that we talked about, right, where everyone is moving and really in the Sun Belt, you know, Southeast and Southwest, you're seeing just more and more of those. So it'll be it'll be really interesting to see how that expands. Um, August, as a, a top performer yourself, uh, what would be the single biggest insight you could provide uh, to our listeners around, uh, you know, your personal personal performance that's yielded the biggest results? Personal performance that yielded the biggest results, um, frankly, is just going to be something my grandfather always used to say is a healthy mind and a healthy body. And it's I'm, I'm, I'm learning more about my body. I'm re- learning more about my, my brain. And uh, I've always been a clever guy. I've always made money. I've always been uh, smart in business, but when my brain performs better, I when I'm in a better mood, when I feel healthier, I always perform better. So I think that's a very important part of it. It's not this, uh, you know, my, I, I can't give you that advice or read this book or read that book or get this coach. Is is really investing in yourself, investing in your health, uh, realizing what types of foods make you perform better, uh, surrounding yourself by positive people. Um, you know, there's a joke on social media is good vibes only. So good vibes only a kind of, kind of mentality, um, longevity, this idea of, you know, that the way that our parents used to live that, you know, they smoked a pack of cigarettes and, uh, you know, that they would just be beat down. That's not the case anymore. You're seeing the pictures and videos of billionaires that are, they're looking literally younger as, as you, we see them on, on social media and we see them online, um, focusing on yourself, focus on your health, focusing on your mind working the uh, you know its best way possible through great diet uh, through relationships uh, that you have with friends uh, and uh, i would say that's that's probably the best advice i can give for you know being be- you know being a high performer love it <laughs> speak in my language and from a you know wealth perspective what would be the single most you know powerful insight you could provide to listeners in terms of how they could accelerate their own wealth journey it would really be diversification. What I saw over the years with a lot of people in real estate, they get hyper-focused in their own, own space. A lot of developers actually go bankrupt because they're so focused into their next project and rolling their their their, their wins into their next deal. They never diversify. So diversification would probably be the best advice when it comes to uh, you know building generational wealth. But again, focus is very important. Focusing on what you do, are great at, but you know, a portion of your surplus needs to be diversified into different asset classes and not to be emotional. You know, you look at, you know, look at the S and P 500, a lot of these investments have done great over the years, but because of their liquidity, people, you know, get emotional and, and they exit something. Uh, and that's a great thing about the GPLP structures and LP because of this illiquidity, people can't get emotional with what's happening in the market and try to exit it. The general partner, makes that decision on behalf of the LP. So diversification, partnering with the right people and uh, you know, good friends, good partners are very difficult to, to find. So when you do find the right partner um, is to uh, cherish that partnership really. Awesome. August, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Uh, if we, people wanna learn more about you or connect with uh, CPI, what's, what's the best place? Yeah, best way to connect with me is um, on LinkedIn, August Biniaz. Um, just search me on, on LinkedIn. Send me a message. I'd love to uh, book a call and uh, chat more. Um, CPICapital.ca is our website. A lot of information. Our blog is on there. Um, you know, our podcast, Real Estate Investing Demystified. But yeah, reach out to me. Send me a message. Love to book a call and have a chat. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on the show today, providing so much value to the listeners. Really appreciate it. Absolutely, my honor and pleasure to be here.